Hi everyone, this is going to be a video walkthrough on problem one on a CS61B Spring 2021 exam prep discussion number seven on asymptotics and ADTs. So this asymptotic asymptotics problem is on the challenging side and it covers asymptotics with multiple recursive calls. Okay, so if you guys are all familiar of where to start for these problems, I recommend watching the first mini lecture in this series, which covers how to approach these types of tree asymptotic problems. Anyways, let's dive into problem one. Using the function g defined below, what is the runtime of the following function calls? Write each answer in terms of n. Okay, so we have some function g, and we're trying to figure out what is the runtime of g of n comma one and g of n comma two. And for both of these runtimes, we're using a theta bound. So whenever we have some sort of bound that's already given to us, we should always understand why we can use that bound, okay? In this context, why can we use a theta bound to describe the runtime of g of n comma one, right? So let's first remember what a theta bound indicates about a function. A theta bound is telling us that the function g always takes the same amount of time. Okay, that's what a theta bound is indicating to us. So before we dive into this question, it's always good just to understand the bound that we're given and what that is indicating about the function we're trying to evaluate. Anywho, so diving into this question, we see that we have the function g that takes in two arguments, n and x. Then we have a simple base case here, and then we issue a bunch of recursive calls. Okay, so when we call g of n comma one, what we'll notice is that we will get the following tree structure, okay? The first time, I'm gonna change the fill. Let's go for a white node, okay? So I'm just creating some nodes to try to document this recursive tree. So we have, the first time we call the function, the input size is n, and I'm gonna also store the value of x here, okay? the value of x is going to be one. Then the next time we call the function, the input size will be n minus one, right? And then the value of x will be one. And notice that when we have x equal to one, we only ever have one recursive call, okay? So we kind of get the following tree. And let me draw one more node. Okay, this is the tree that we get. And the inside of each node, I like to think about it as the work for that recursive call. So the first time we call G, actually every time we call G, we can think about G as doing constant work. Okay, so to try to figure out the total runtime of this function, we just need to figure out what's the sum of all of these nodes, okay? So we can kind of see that how many nodes are in this tree. They are n nodes. Each node is doing a constant amount of work, which means the runtime is going to be theta of n, right? And the reason, just to reiterate, is that we have this following sum of one plus one plus one, and there's n of these ones, okay? So let's move on to the next example. And in this example, we call the next problem is g of n comma two, okay? So exploring that possibility, the first call, I'm just gonna kind of adapt this tree we have right here, is going to be n comma two, okay? So what's cool about this is that we will still issue the call of n minus one comma one but we will also issue another recursive call. I'll put that one right here. Of n minus one comma two, okay? And it's still the case that every recursive call does a constant amount of work. So every time we see one of these circles, we're just gonna fill it in with one. So let's explore this tree that's currently forming by looking at one more layer of the tree, okay? So I'm gonna move this down a bit. So looking at another layer of this tree, what will happen is if we look at the call 
to n minus 1 comma 1. If we're looking at this call right now, we know that it's going to produce the same behavior of this function over here, right? the first example. What that means is just going to send a bunch of recursive calls down, just one call each time. So this call will only produce one new call to n minus 2 comma 1. Okay. On the other hand, if we look at this node over here, it'll issue two recursive calls. It'll issue a recursive call to n minus 2 comma 1. It'll also issue a recursive call to n minus 2 comma 2. Okay. And what we will notice is that if we continue repeating this process, there's an important realization in which every level, this is what we define as a level. I say this is level 0, level 1, level 2. Every level will have one more node than the previous level above it. Okay. So what we're kind of seeing is that this tree is going to look something like this following fashion. It's going to look kind of like this triangle, right? And what's important to realize here is that to figure out the runtime of this tree that's forming, which will look like this triangle I've created, the next step right, in this video I mentioned in the beginning is to try to figure out the work per level. So if we look at level 0, the amount of work we're doing at level 0 is going to be one work. Okay. If we look at level 1, we're going to be doing two work. If we look at level two, notice that we'll be doing three work, okay? And notice at this bottom level, I'll say this is the bottom level, we'll be doing roughly n work, right? So how did I get that there's n work at the bottom level? Well, notice that the height of this tree, this height is still n, right? So what that implies is if each level has one more node than the level above it, the bottom level will have a total of n nodes. OK, so the total runtime of our function is going to be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way up till n. right? And we know that looking at that sum of 1, plus 2, plus 3, plus n, that sum is equal to n squared asymptotically. OK? I realize that's a little out of view, but basically I just said that sum is equal to n squared. So over here, we can put that answer down. OK, exciting. So let's move on to the next one. I'm going to quickly clear all of this stuff out of the way. OK. Moving on to the next part. So now we're going to change line 6 to g of n minus 1 comma x and change the stopping condition in the for loop to i is less than or equal to f of x. OK, so all we're doing is that now we have an x instead of this i. And we do i is less than f of x instead of i is less than or equal to x, or i is less than or equal to f of x. Okay. And what is f? f returns a random number between 1 and x inclusive. Okay. So let's kind of see like how that, that would play out. And what we notice is for the following function calls, find the tightest omega and big O bounds. Okay. So let's recall like what omega and big O bounds are before we dive into this problem. An omega bound or a tight omega bound is a bound that says the runtime of this function will never be faster than this bound. That's what an omega bound is. A big O bound is saying the runtime of this function will never be worse than this bound. Okay. So the easiest way to find omega and big O bounds is to think about the best and worst case behavior of a function and prove to yourself that you can never do worse than this, or you can never do better than that. Okay, And then that'll be a tight omega and big O bound. Okay, So looking at this following function, let's try to explore g of n comma 2 first. So what will happen is that we will have the initial call. Oh, that's not a circle. 
we'll have the initial call to G where we pass an N comma two, okay? And again, in this problem, we'll notice that every time we have some sort of call to G, we always do a constant amount of work, okay? So after calling G of N comma two, we will issue two recursive calls, right? Because, oh, I take that back. We will issue a maximum of two recursive calls because f of x will either give us one or two. So the most amount of recursive calls we could possibly do is two. The least amount is one, okay? So exploring this omega bound, let's try to think about the behavior where our function is as fast as possible, which means we want to do as little work as possible, which means we want to explore the possibility when we only issue one recursive call, right? Exploring this possibility, what we will notice is that this one recursive call will call g of n minus one comma two, right? It'll only have one call. And every time in the future, whenever we call g, we will only ever have one recursive call in this omega possibility, right? Exploring this best case, we can never do better than this. So what we see is that this is kind of how this tree will look. It'll look like n minus two comma two, and then eventually we will get to zero comma two, okay? So the total amount of work this function is doing in this best case possibility when we minimize the total amount of recursive calls is going to be the sum of all of these nodes, which we know to be n, okay? And what I'm gonna assume now is that when we're looking at this other case, it has that same omega bound as the first case, right? Because in both possibilities, the tightest omega bound happens when we minimize the number of recursive calls. And if n is like the upper limit to f of x, we can still have one recursive call every time, right? So in both of these cases, it's going to be omega of n. So now let's explore the big O of n comma two, okay? How this is going to look is we want to think about the case when we do as much work as possible, right? An omega bound is a bound where it's like a tight upper bound, right? So intuitively, to think about us doing as much work as possible, we will do as many recursive calls as possible, okay? So what that implies is that when x is equal to two, we can only do two recursive calls as a maximum each time, right? So what we'll see here is that we kind of get the following tree like so, right? And then I'll do one more layer of this tree. Okay, so adding one more layer. We can kind of see that each level of the tree has twice as many nodes as the level before it, okay? So let's try to figure out the next step, which I like to do, is try to figure out the work per level, okay? So I'll create this column here called the work per level. Actually, you guys can't really see that because my face is in the way. So let me move that down a bit. Okay, so we're creating this work per level column and we can see that the top level of the tree does one work. The second level does two work. The third level does four work, right? I'm just summing all of the nodes at that level. And what we will see is that if we look at the bottom of this tree, right, at the bottom level of this tree, we will be doing two to the end work. So how did I get there, right? That was like kind of a leap there, Soham. So what we'll notice is that if we look at an arbitrary level of this tree, right, looking at this level here, we can say that we're doing two to the level work, right? Or we can kind of think about like the work per level doubles each time, 
So at level zero, let's say this is level zero, this is level one, this is level two, we're doing two to the zero work. At the next level, we're doing two to the one work. At this level, we're doing two squared work, right? So at the bottom level, since the height of this tree, which I think is reasonable to conclude this height is n because we decrease by one every time. What we'll notice is that the bottom level of this tree is at level n, right? If the levels decrease or increase by one as we keep going down the tree. So what we will see is that the bottom level of this tree will be doing work two to the n. And to find the total runtime of this function, we will try to figure out what's the value of the sum of one plus two plus four plus two to the n, okay? And what we will notice now is that this is a sum I like to call a dominating sum, where the last term in the sum is so much bigger than all of the previous terms, it dominates them, and we can characterize this sum solely by this last term and ignore all the terms before it. And what we will see here is that that gives us two to the n as a tight upper bound, because we will never do worse than big O of two to the n, okay? So now let's consider the last possibility or the last case, which is g of n comma n, okay? So looking at g of n comma n, I'm gonna adapt this tree to that possibility. Actually, this tree looks pretty bad, so let's just scrap it entirely. Okay, we're starting from scratch. So g of n comma n is actually very similar to g of n comma two. We will start off with a call to n comma n. And then in the worst case possibility, right, to find this tight upper bound, we will do as many recursive calls as possible, right? In this case, the most amount of recursive calls we can possibly do is n recursive calls. So let's just say that we do These are like nodes here that I'm just not drawing for the sake of keeping them concise. We do n recursive calls where each of these recursive calls has input n minus one n, okay? So what we will notice now is, let's just do one more layer of this tree. What we will see is that using the same argument from before, if we try to figure out work per level, we will notice that this top level has one work, right? Because there's a one here. Looking at this next level, there's n nodes at this level, right? Because we issue n recursive calls. So we can kind of see that this next level is doing n work. Where's my work per level? Okay. Then looking at this next level, we're seeing we're doing n squared work, right? Because each of these n recursive calls issues another and recursive calls. And what we will realize is that the total work we're going to be doing is the sum of one plus n plus n squared. This is my total work to reiterate. Plus what's at the end of the sum, right? The end of the sum you guys will kind of see here is n to the n because each level has the number of nodes of the previous level multiplied by n. Right. In other words, what we're really doing here is that the total number of nodes per level is going to be n to the L. Right. It's the same thing we did last time. Instead of doing two to the L this time, now we're doing n to the L. So if we're looking at the bottom level where L is equal to n, this is for the bottom level, then we can see at this bottom level that the sum or the value is n to the n, okay? Finally, bringing this all together, we see that this is the following sum we have. And this is also a dominating sum where this last term in the sum dominates, right? And I think that's, it may seem like, how did you figure out this is a dominating sum? Well, think about the example that if we put a two here, Right, that was the previous case, it was a dominating sum. So if we increase the value of two to n, because n is bigger than two, this will be an even bigger dominating sum, right? 
if that isn't like enough to prove, just like plug in like n is equal to eight. And you'll see it's like one plus eight plus 64. Like you see how much bigger the later terms are than the previous ones. So prove to yourself that this is a dominating sum and a dominating sum is characterized by the last term of the sum. In this case, it's n to the n, okay? So what we'll see here is that this is n to the n, okay? So that is all for problem one. I hope you guys found this helpful and good luck on the next one. It's a tough one.